Welcome to today's webinar, Collect, Create, Classify, Curate, Enhancing and Integrating Planning and Emergency Management Capabilities, hosted by the Maryland Department of Planning in association with the Smart Growth Network. My name is Michael Bayer. I'm the Manager of Infrastructure and Development at the Maryland Department of Planning and Project Manager for the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse. The Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse is a project of the Smart Growth Network supported by the U.S. EPA's Office of Community Revitalization and managed by the Maryland Department of Planning. In addition to hosting webinars, the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse has a website at smartgrowth.org that provides information on effective growth, development, and preservation practices. The Clearinghouse provides information to help local decision makers foster healthy, resilient, and economically vibrant communities. The Clearinghouse is also the virtual home of the Smart Growth Network, a nationally recognized coalition of leadership organizations that have formally endorsed the principles of smart growth. This webinar is one in a series of webinars produced by the Maryland Department of Planning on smart growth and planning topics available for viewing at smartgrowth.org. You can also find out about planning initiatives, planning tools, and educational opportunities in Maryland by visiting the Maryland Department of Planning's website at planning.maryland.gov. We are recording this webinar and will be posting it on our website under the Webinar Archives tab. We encourage you to visit the website and to subscribe to our e-newsletter to learn about our upcoming webinars. The views expressed by the speakers in this webinar are those of the speakers and not necessarily of the Maryland Department of Planning or the State of Maryland. Viewers of this live event are eligible to receive one and a half CM credits from the American Planning Association, as well as one Sustainability and Resilience CM credit, and 1.5 CNUA CEU self-reported credits from the Congress for the New Urbanism. To log your AICP credits, visit the American Planning Association's website at planning.org, log into your account, and search for the name of today's event, which is Collect, Create, Classify, and Curate, Enhancing and Integrating Planning and Emergency Management Capabilities. You can also search for event number 925-5574. So today our speakers are uh, Deepa Srinivasan, Ashley Samanowski, and Andrew Estrain. Deepa Srinivasan is the founder and president of Vision Planning and Consulting in Maryland. She has more than 25 years of experience in policy consultation, project development and implementation, hazard mitigation planning, stakeholder engagement, and public outreach. A certified planner and certified floodplain manager, Deepa has managed more than 100 projects in all phases of emergency management for state and local governments and for federal agencies. She was recently recognized as one of 21 fellows of the Coalition of Disaster Resilience Infrastructure for the project Integrating Plans and Strengthening Communications Through Machine Learning that will be highlighted in our webinar today. Ashley Samanowski is of VPC has more than 10 years of hazard mitigation continuity of operations, emergency management, stakeholder engagement, communications, and public outreach experience with federal, state, county, local, private, and nonprofit agencies, organizations, and stakeholders. She has served as a subject matter expert and project manager on federal projects for NOAA, DOI, BLM, and FEMA. She also has served on the Maryland Geographic Information uh, Committee and currently serves on the Mer Maryland Heritage Areas Authority Grants Review Panel. Finally, Andrew Estrain of EPC is a community planner who specializes in resiliency and disaster planning and hazard mitigation planning. He has worked with local, state, and federal partners to develop plans and materials to streamline the disaster management process. He also supports the firm's land use planning, emergency management planning, and historic preservation projects and stakeholder engagement. Following their presentation, our presenters will answer as many questions as time permits. As always, you can submit a question anytime by using the questions tool located in the control panel on the right side of your screen. And as usual, we're going to start with a few polls uh, today. If you're unable to um, respond to this, you may need to exit from full screen mode. As always, the first question is just asking where everybody in the audience uh, lives and works, and you can see the options there. Uh, West, Midwest, South, Mid-Atlantic, Northeast, and if you're outside the U.S., you can choose international. And we'll keep this open for about 45 seconds or so, so folks can respond. And then we'll share the results and then um, move on to the next question. 
and thank you again for being with us today. Give you a couple more seconds to respond and thanks to everybody who is. As always, the um, audience is different for our various webinars, so it's always interesting to see where everyone is from. So today, 35% of the audience is in the Mid-Atlantic, 20% uh, in the South, 18% uh, in the West and Midwest, and 9% of our audience is international. So that, we're gonna open up the second question. And this is, what is your area of expertise? So you have five options you can choose from. The first one is land use comprehensive or site planner. Second is transportation planner. Third is environmental planner. Fourth is hazard, hazard mitigation planner or emergency planner. And then finally, other planner or profession. And again, we'll give you all some time to respond. And if you're having trouble with that, you may need to exit from full screen mode. And we are seeing the results come in. So thank you for uh, participating in this. couple more seconds here and we'll close this up. So for this one, 38% are land use and comprehensive planners, 28% uh, are other, 17% transportation planner, 12% environmental, and then 6% hazard mitigation and emergency planner. We have one last poll for you today. And that is finally, what sector are you in? Are you public, private sector, nonprofit, academia, or other? And again, we'll give a few seconds for this and then I'll turn it over to Deepa. And we're happy to have Deepa back with us, with our DPC colleagues. Uh, we have a lot of uh, programming scheduled for the fall. So uh, thank you for being here. Hope to see you again at the future webinars we're doing. Give you a couple more seconds to respond. Looks like folks are doing that. So we'll close this up in a second or two. Excellent. So 71% of the audience is reporting as public sector, 19% private, 4% nonprofit, and 3% academia and other. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Deepa and her team. Welcome, Deepa. And you'll just need to unmute Deepa. Thank you, Michael. Good afternoon and welcome. Collect, classify, curate, create. Enhancing plan integration and emergency management capabilities through knowledge management. Today, we will be taking a close look at how we can integrate plans and strengthen communications through smart learning to achieve community resilience. We will begin with a brief background on why, on why we developed this idea. We'll discuss resilience, talk about plan integration and its challenges, and then introduce a proposed solution to enhance integrated planning efforts through a smart knowledge management system and highlight key features of this application. Finally, we will look at a few use cases from communities around the country on where this application could be put to good use. Next slide, please. In September 2020, BPC was awarded a fellowship by the Co Coalition of Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, CDRI. CDRI is a partnership of national governments, UN agencies and programs multilateral development banks, the private sector, and knowledge institutions from 18 countries worldwide. The CDRI Fellowship Program encourages students, practitioners, researchers, and community workers from CDRI member countries to apply ideas on how to keep infrastructure resilient to climate and disaster risks. So our topic highlighted integrating plans and strengthening communications through machine learning, and our research problem addressed the inadequacy of manual plan integration process through automation. Next slide. As planners, be it transportation, land use, comprehensive planning, hazard mitigation, or policy planning, we serve a variety of roles with a common goal to achieve resiliency. 
We work closely with community officials to facilitate planning processes, assess existing and future risk and vulnerabilities, examine community capabilities, and identify potential solutions. We're also an important nexus to how communities are designed and developed. Hazard mitigation planners, for example, play a key role in making communities more resilient by strengthening connections between mitigation and the goals of other local plans and by emphasizing the value of mitigation in improving community resilience. So as planners, we plan, we implement, we advocate, we communicate and streamline uh, processes as well as improve efficiencies internally. Next slide. So let's define some terms here so we're all on the same page. Resilience is the capacity of communities and governments to adapt to changing conditions and to prepare for, withstand, and rapidly recover from disruptions such as hazard events back to everyday life. FEMA design, defines a resilient community as one that makes proactive investment and policy decisions, communicates risk and vulnerability to all, builds public and private sector capabilities and partnerships, and resumes normal operations and recovers rapidly from hazard events. Hazard mitigation planning is the foundation of community resilience. It encourages the development of a long-term mitigation strategy to reduce risk. By working through the planning process and assessing their risks and developing mitigation actions before a disaster occurs, communities are better prepared to recover from hazard events. So critical connection exists between preparedness from an organizational standpoint and the ability of a community to bounce back after disruption to achieve resilience. This will be the focus of our discussion today. Next slide, please. So as we aim to address resilience, we must focus on integrating emergency management, hazard mitigation, climate change, and risk reduction principles into the wide array of local community planning initiatives. Plan review and integration is the process by which communities can look critically at their existing planning framework and align efforts with the goal of building a safer, smarter, and more resilient community. Next slide. So what is integrated planning from a resilience standpoint? It is a two-way exchange of information between hazard mitigation plans, both state and local, and all other planning mechanisms. Integrated planning allows to effectively blend plans and policies across disciplines and agencies in a community by considering the potential of hazards as one, is the, one of the key factors in future development. So as hazard mitigation planners, we firmly believe that hazard mitigation plans must integrate into areas such as land use, transportation, climate change, sustainability, natural and cultural, natural and cultural resource protection, watershed management, and economic development. Next slide. Integration must also be achieved through agencies. So the key question here is how much are these agencies and departments integrating horizontally within the same jurisdictional framework? For example, is the county planning and development department and the emergency management agency collaborating effectively on the development of a floodplain development policy? Uh, is the emergency management agency and the building department coordinating effectively on damage assessments? Are planning and are the planning and transportation departments collaborating and I, on identifying solutions for transportation improvement projects? Next slide. Also, are your departments integrating vertically by aligning policies, goals, and objectives upward through your county or state departments, or downward? Where you, are your policies being pushed from the state to local governments, or are federal dollars and grant requirements being communicated effectively from grantees to subgrantees? Next slide. Another question we ask is how are we integrating via our planning products? Are our documents speaking to one another? Are we following the whole community approach, looking at integrating plans and ordinances, programs, and policies? So ideally, a variety of different plans should be integrated, but the sheer volume of plans in a jurisdiction can be overwhelming to review. Who has the time or even the inclination to integrate these plans manually? 
jurisdictional plans involve everything from comprehensive plans to revitalization plans to climate adaptation studies to strategic plans and so on and so forth. So how can we integrate effectively? Next slide. So some of the challenges of, of integrated planning, many of the documents are stored on a variety of different mediums, ranging from paper copies to CDs, to the network drive, to a thumb drive, or even a hard drive at home. This makes searching, finding, searching, and interacting with these departments a challenge during blue skies, let alone when a disaster strikes. When documents are improperly stored, named, or cataloged, or stored across different mediums or platforms, it creates a lack of ownership or responsibility for document ma maintenance and updates. Also, manually reviewing each of these documents is time consuming and rather difficult, and also opens up the likelihood of human error. The time to manually review the plans may be long, and the staffing and budgeting might be inadequate. There may be also various interpretations of the purpose and the intent of these planning products, and drawing conclusions based on them can become very challenging. In addition to various interpretations, another challenge uh, is that there may be limited or lack of communication between departments. There may also be a lack of systematic methodology, or the methodology may vary from person to person, from department to department, people who are doing the plan review, which lives, which leads to a lack of consistency between reviews, as well as to errors and omissions. And finally, there's no real organized way to harness the wealth of information a planner or emergency manager has or when they leave or when they retire or resign from a position. When they leave, knowledge leaves the door with them. 30 years of knowledge simply cannot be harnessed in 30 days. Next. So to address these challenges, we examine technologies such as machine learning to aid in the integrated planning efforts and allow for more cohesive information sharing, interoperability, and coordination between different levels of government, plans, people, and policies. The objectives of this effort were to explore concepts such as taxonomies and ontologies to collect, curate, and harness knowledge, to explore and identify tools and applications to support interoperability between and across plans and government departments, and to reduce silos and achieve resilience within local government departments through organizational preparedness. We developed a robust and custom-built resilience emergency management planning ontology that we, be, we will be elaborating on shortly, which could be used to collect, curate, and harness knowledge and efficiently and effectively integrate plans. Next slide. Our solution focused on developing a smart knowledge management application using machine learning to identify where and how concepts are addressed in various planning departments, but in planning documents. The application has the ability to be used across all devices, both in the office and out in the field. It has classifiable and searchable functions to help search for a concept and be able to pull information on how, inf how this concept is addressed in various planning documents. And it also provides a way of automated integrated planning and a new and more efficient way of collaborating on future planning efforts, both horizontally and vertically. Next slide. We use machine learning for the advanced searching of plans, discussing specific planning concepts such as resilience and sustainability as a process to help governments examine existing planning frameworks and align plans, goals, visions, policies, and actions while reducing contradictions. So this enables you to cross-link between departments with ease, as the graphic suggests. Next slide. So let's look at this application as a new way of integrated planning and a more efficient way of integrating future planning efforts. The key features of this application, it addresses daily barriers of organization. It serves as an integration think tank for emergency management, planning, et cetera. It includes a faceted search within the cloud to easily identify specific documents and specific items within documents. It utilizes custom cloud storage to store all necessary documents in one location and offers encryption. 
It allows for version control. And finally, it allows for position or agency-specific tasking and, and assignments, as we will be elaborating on shortly. In terms of benefits, the application will eliminate the potential for human error. It will save ta review time for planners as, as they would not have to physically review large documents. It will help save search results. It will allow you to capture and retain knowledge that you have gained from performing the advanced or complex searches in the past. Next slide. So let's delve into the ontology a bit, shall we? So we built this brain, which is a planning and emergency management ontology. The brain was developed on the database of standards, policies, and best practices from disaster management and planning domains. So what is an ontology? Simply put, it is a set of concepts and categories in a subject area or domain that shows their properties and their relationships between them. So key concepts such as objectives, assumptions, goals, metrics, et cetera, related to planning and emergency management were identified, defined, and then tied together through reasoning. So it is akin to teaching a child words, meanings, and relationships. Once the brain was built, the ontology was tested, plans were uploaded and stored in the application, which also serves as a repository for plans of all types. We then use natural language processing and NLP which helped digest the documents and pulls terms related to disaster management, planning, emergencies, sustainability, et cetera. The system then looks for terms and matches them with the, with the NLP. The terms are then tagged, which helps in searching for information. For example, it's like think about tagging a piece of art in a museum, which where the artwork has the name of the painter, the year it was painted, where it was found, the history, et cetera. So each, each term was tagged appropriately. Next slide, please. So here is an example of various terms in a, a community characteristics section of a, of a comprehensive plan. So for each concept, definitions and descriptions were developed and informed by at least two sources, which is which you can see on the right hand of the screen, the right side of the screen. These sources were different, distinctive, and authoritative, and in some cases, um, the term was informed by up to five different sources. Capturing verbiage from different sources was very important in developing an ontology in order to make it holistic and ensure that it addresses all aspects and characteristics of the term and phrases included. Capturing as much information about a specific term is also critical in ensuring that the machine learn uh, has a full understanding of the concept and through this definition and relationships established, will be able to pinpoint where anything related to a specific term is located within a planning department, so within a planning document, so it can show related terms. Next slide. So this slide here shows an example of the various terms used in a demographics or a land use section of a comprehensive plan on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, you can see three definitions that were pulled from different sources for land use. Next slide. This here is a graphic that shows the relationship of one term. We have identified hazard mitigation plan in the middle. Um, and on the right hand side, you can, I, you can see terms which are parts of a hazard mitigation plan, such as the hazard identification, profiling, vulnerability assessment, capability assessment, loss estimation, uh, mitigation uh, actions. And on the extreme right, you can see additional links to mitigation actions, different types of actions, educational and awareness related actions, uh, natural system prote uh, protection related actions, structural actions, infrastructure related actions, uh, actions related to policies in local plans and regulations. So this is a, a, very, a very basic snapshot of one term and its linkages. So you might want to imagine this uh, our ontology as a very large neural network that connects each term to every other term to a, through a series of relationships. So the application um, has over 500, uh, over 800 terms. Next slide, please. This, this graphic here shows uh, a, that a series of relation types were created, relationship types were created and attributed to certain concepts. 
So for example, A is a subset of B, or A is caused by B, A is exacerbated by B, A may be addressed in B, or A may be impacted in B. So for every one of those 800 terms, we looked at various relationships to ensure that there is, there is a clear link of one or more relationships between two terms. So each term can have several relationships or one relationship, and that's how the neural network is built. Next slide, please. So how do we use this ontology in practice? How does it work and what benefits does it provide? So in the next few slides, Ashley will be able to answer some of these questions and walk you through how we put this concept to use in our plan integration and search activities. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Deepa. Machine learning is already integrated through everyday products and services. We use them every day from everything from shopping to entertainment. So why not in emergency planning and preparedness? We can narrow down potential products while shopping based on needs and preferences. Or if we like one movie or series on a streaming platform, the system will automatically recommend other titles that might be of interest. As Deepa mentioned earlier with the CDRI Fellowship, there are already some products in development to meet this need. So how do we turn assorted files into a searchable library? And for this example, we are going to use the library analogy, and I'll thank you in advance for tolerating my love of Gothic fiction. Instead of walking up and down rows of shelves looking for something, we can conduct a search, or we could seek recommendations, or sometimes both. When we go to the library, we may know exactly what we need. For instance, writing a book report on a specific title or topic, such as Dracula or monsters in general. Or perhaps we're browsing for something without a clear understanding or idea of what we want or need. I like Stephen King books, so the librarian might recommend Dean Kuhn's books. Or I liked Dracula, so they're going to recommend Salem's Lot. Sometimes we want something specific, but only know a few fragments of information about it. For instance, I read the book in high school. It was 200 pages long. I think it was written in the 30s. And I remember it talked about a woman surviving a hurricane. Uh, bonus points if anyone can name that book. So again, how do we turn assorted files into a searchable library? It all starts with tagging. And tagging is just the techie way of saying labeling. It's the action of attaching a label to someone or something. We see it every day on social media. Tag me on Facebook, tag me on Twitter, or hashtag smart growth, hashtag webinar. But in IT systems, a tag is a keyword or term assigned to a piece of information. This kind of tag data helps describe an item and then allows it to be found again in the future through searching or browsing. When we upload a document through the natural language processing, it's generally a three-step process. The system parses each plan, ordinance, document, or other file type into individual pages. It then begins tagging each of those pages with any of the terms or concepts that are found on that page that it also recognizes from the ontology. These tags then become part of the metadata for the file. And now we have created a fully searchable page or document uh, or file within our library system. This metadata, which basically means data about data, is the key to a searchable library. The metadata tagging process is systematically assigning those tags to all of the assets in our collection, in this case, our file library, using a rules-based system to ensure consistency. By utilizing metadata, the ontology provides a new tailored way to search files, which focuses on planning and emergency management terms and concepts which were defined in the ontology. This assists with integrated planning by saving both time and reducing the potential for human error. If you've ever tried to find a file that you've stored somewhere among the dozens or potentially hundreds of folders on your computer, or even in paper format using a filing cabinet, you understand how painfully slow finding a file or document can be if you don't know its precise location. Conversely, searching for a specific document can take seconds instead of minutes 
or even hours if you're still using paper file, because you don't need to recall the precise location or even the name of the file in most cases. Instead, you can simply enter some descriptive terms associated with the file into the system and it will retrieve the item you're looking for. This slide gives examples of various kinds of metadata each file could contain. This is just an example of some of the facets. There could potentially be dozens more. In addition to common properties found in a Word document, such as file name, author, size, etc., we can also tie these files to specific projects, date ranges, administrations, and funding programs, which allows us a greater variety in our search parameters. For example, I could be looking for an after action report from a flood event during a previous gubernatorial administration and for a specific county. Essentially, with staff promotions, retirements, or other turnover, providing as much information as possible on each regulatory planning, outreach, or other type of product is critical to its searchability and usability going forward. There can be two types of searches done with this ontology, a faceted search and a semantic search, which I'm going to discuss on the following slides. A faceted search allows us to search for something specific that I may have complete or partial information on. For instance, if I'm looking for a mitigation plan that discusses floods and is in the mid-Atlantic area, the system might return a university hazard mitigation plan, a county HMP, and perhaps a state HMP. The more facets we input into the system, the smaller the list of returns we'll get. If you searched a term such as flood, which is the most common hazard in the world, you would get literally hundreds, if not thousands of returns. But by using facets, we're narrowing down our search to only those documents meeting all of our identified criteria. And this helps return perhaps a dozen results instead of hundreds. If we're not quite sure what we're looking for, the semantic search method is good for searching for files that discuss concepts and the potential relationships between those concepts or even between relationships between various products. For instance, I may want information on floods and demographics, specifically those people living in poverty. And the system might recommend I look at an area such as New Orleans and how residents were impacted by Katrina, or it could suggest that I look to past years to see growth or changes over time. In this case, it suggested New York City's 2009 hazard mitigation plan. Or finally, it might refer me to a study that was on how disasters impact people of low socioeconomic status. Again, by tagging all of our files, documents, products, et cetera, with as much metadata as possible, we create a fully queryable database out of our entire collection of files. As Deepa mentioned, a knowledge management system was developed for the CDRI fellowship. Those efforts provided additional features to users, including task and workflow assignments. The system allows administrators to assign tasks to various users based on their permissions, file ownership, responsibilities, etc. Users can also tag documents manually. They can annotate documents, assign documents to someone else, and even monitor task progress and redistribute the workload if necessary. Another feature is the reminders. This way workflows can provide information on when a document is due or perhaps uh, grant cycle reminders, annual reviews, et cetera. You might also set up reminders for due dates for letters of intent, various grant applications, or planned submission dates. You can also set up reminders for others within your system. Finally, a dashboard screen was developed. This provides a snapshot of the entire smart knowledge management system in real time. A variety of dynamic charts and displays were provided to monitor the use, progress, and storage of files inside the system. This includes 
team tasks for the day, week, or month, user activity, user applications such as the file storage, and even the most popular concepts in tagging. And an effective knowledge management system should be tailored to fit your agency's needs and mission. I'm now gonna turn this over to Andrew to discuss some potential use cases for a system such as this. Andrew? Thank you, Ashley. Um, as Ashley just discussed, I will be starting to discuss some potential case uses, which is really going to um, put into understanding some of these features and benefits that are offered, as well as uh, connected to how they address some of the challenges of manual integration that Deepa discussed during her presentation. Uh, for the background, uh, general background for the first case study uh, deals with loss of knowledge due to turnover. Um, and this was dealing with a rural county of about 100,000 people. Um, this was uh, Mid-Atlantic County. And the county was tasked with updating a FEMA approved county hazard mitigation plan. Um, and it's important to note that the project is being developed uh, by the Department of Emergency Services and is being updated by a private consultant. And just some, again, some general situation that was going on um, as it is and was going on with this project is there was a lot of turnover at key positions. Uh, the chief of the emergency services and public safety uh, stepped down during the midst of updating that hazard mitigation plan. And this was not relayed back to the consultant in ample time um, as far as the plan development process was going. In addition to that, uh, the chief of the planning department who also provided some significant uh, information and um, provided coordination between municipalities and, and government agencies uh, also changed positions during that plan update and became a representative of a specific local municipality so that position um, the position changed and the person was still there to provide you know some expertise that he had but although um, the exact type of information that was expected out of him did change. And then finally, the third piece of turnover um, was the turnover in the lead planner um, who had taken many responsibilities from the chief after that turnover. And when that plan was submitted back to FEMA for review, uh, that planner um, also changed roles and stepped down from that position as well. So there was a bit of loss of communication during that process. Some challenges that came about um, as a result of this um, was general loss of information and loss of uh, established communication and coordination. So generally that communication and coordination was uh, very much disrupted and had to be reestablished. And several tax tasks that had been previously completed um, had to be completed again as specific information was not shared during the course of the turnover. And again, um, on that communication and collaboration and coordination, not just between uh, the consultant and you know, government agencies, but also between government departments and specific municipalities. Um, after determining, um, after the consultant determined that a there was a change in the point of contact and the lead uh, on this project at the county level, it was noticed that the retainment of knowledge was not passed down during that turnover and especially at the top when that chief left their position so that really resulted in a lot of loss of awareness of um, the overall planning process and finally unfindable files which kind of go back toward the whole information loss theme here uh, files that were previously stored uh, on the chief's computer or on the uh, lead planner's computer uh, were no longer accessible, resulting in, again, that information loss where that communication and coordination had to be reestablished. Next slide, please. And to address some of these challenges through the knowledge management system is um, proposed outcome would be a knowledge management system that provides a central repository for file management and for document organization. Uh, this system would allow for um, access and version control of specific documents, centralized cloud storage and shared libraries to ensure that retainment of knowledge in case of turnover at that, those important positions, 
and to further encourage that collaboration and communication and that integration for, during future planning efforts. Some general features uh, and benefits that Ashley discussed that would be very beneficial for this specific case use, again, is that integrated and centralized cloud-based filing system and storage system for all documents, uh, planning process related, uh, that access and version control for editable documents. Um, as contacts change or as representative change, representatives change over the course of the planning cycle, um, those contacts can be uh, easily reestablished or revised through the centralized system. And just overall would avoid that loss of knowledge and overall information either from plan update to plan update or as uh, positions turnover at the county or municipal level. Getting into our second potential case use here, uh, discusses the development of a community risk assessment with a real focus on sharing across stakeholders, both vertically um, between different levels of government and horizontally between uh, government agencies and plans and people. And some general background on the situation for this, for this case use. Um, again, uh, local agency is tasked with developing this uh, community risk assessment. And this CRA specifically combines three specific documents, which is the hazard identification and risk assessment, the threat and hazard identification and risk assessment, and local community risk assessments, jurisdictional ones. And these will all be combined into one document. And it must be uh, noted that planners must meet the same minimum requirements as if all three documents were still standalone. And although this is, uh, focused on hazard mitigation and emergency management, the general concept of this, of this situation can really be applied across uh, many different planning realms and fields. Also, several different agencies were involved, which is uh, very important in this process. As I said, sharing across stakeholders was key for this project. Um, there was coordination with several different key players and agencies, and that included bringing in emergency management, police, fire and medical, public works, transportation, health and human services, and um, other supporting agencies as well. And sharing of documents is very critical for this project, as we must be able to share out draft versions or specific sections with specific strategic stakeholders. And they also protect must protect specific documents, as some may be for official use only. Based on that background and uh, that situation there, some challenges uh, that came about. Again, uh, one challenge is that must meet uh, three different sets of requirements. And that includes coordinating with um, the subject matter experts from each one of those. Version control was a challenge. Uh, with, with many draft documents, it got confusing as to which document was up to date and the appropriate one to view and edit. And there was some issues with um, some people working on wrong versions, which ended up being uh, a glitch within the system. Um, and it was not documenting specific edits for a period of time and would not have been an issue if that centralized platform had not glitched. Um, another challenge was collaboration with strategic partners and specific agencies. Again, there were several, um, as I stated before, at least six or seven different agencies that were involved in the development of this assessment. And finally, and arguably biggest um, hurdle in general for this project was the tracking of progress and workflow assignments. Um, deadlines were generally, uh, generally set pretty loose as there was no way to really track that workflow progress for specific tasks and the overall document development and, and the overall project. And to address some of these challenges through this knowledge management system, uh, the knowledge management system would focus on file management to make certain that appropriate personnel. You can go next slide, please, Ashley. The knowledge management system would focus on file management to make certain the appropriate personnel have access to the beneficial and necessary resources, also ensuring user permissions and version control, and to help understand overall workflow progression. The knowledge management application would emphasize that systematic sharing of specific documents and allow users to search for specific information and data within a set of documents, as well as to track that progress and allow for tasking of assignments as well. Um, to go 
to take some of those features and benefits a little a step further. As I said, um, specific users can search for specific information as Ashley discussed through the semantic and faceted searches. Uh, there are no faceted searches with traditional centralized platforms such as SharePoint. And when combining three, uh, three products together, a uh, faceted or semantic search could be a very beneficial use to ensure that all critical information is captured um, and all requirements are captured from the three different sets of requirements. As far as tasking assignments and as reminders, again, some centralized platforms do not allow to task out uh, specific assignments, uh, whereas our system would um, not only allow anybody working on the project to see what tasks they are assigned to, the system would also send out reminders to ensure specific tasks got it uh, completed uh, in ample time and to ensure that the project schedule remains uh, remains on schedule. And again, the prog progress and workflow dashboards, this would really help visualize progress on the overall document development. For example, uh, you may have somebody working on a task related to hazard identification, and then later on in the process have a different person working on a, a task related to hazard ranking. And they may have not been in coordination at all throughout the process, and therefore uh, that knowledge was not transferred from one task to another. Uh, but with this uh, with some progress or workflow dashboards that would be included in this system would allow for um, any user to be able to visualize that progress on the overall project and document development and just overall um, our solution would enhance that integrated um, would really enhance integrated and automated uh, integration to reduce those challenges of manually trying to integrate these three documents together Getting into our third case study, this also does have to uh, centers around hazard mitigation and emergency management as well. But again, I do wanna state that um, although it is specifically a hazard mitigation plan update, this could be applied to any plan that needs to go through, uh, that is a county or state-based plan that needs to go through a review either at the state or federal level. This was specifically an update to an enhanced hazard mitigation plan for a state on the East Coast, uh, Mid-Atlantic area specifically. And just general background, some collaboration and coordination, again, was required both vertically uh, between all counties within the state, the state and federal level, and also horizontally uh, between specific plans that the state has or specific plans that the counties may have that can be integrated uh, into those state plans and vice versa. And it is important to note that this uh, this project did utilize a centralized platform, um, which is um, just some good knowledge to know going into this project. Some challenges that came about during the development of this hazard mitigation plan, uh, this enhanced state hazard mitigation plan, uh, was receiving, sending and receiving information requests from jurisdictions, which was um, kind of the overall theme of the general challenges that came about um, when asking specific local municipalities or counties for any specific plans or documents that they may that they might have for example a continuity of operations plan or a uh, pre-disaster recovery plan uh, and they didn't answer that information was not given back to us so that had to be put into a survey format as a yes or no question, which really eliminated the potential for that integration of um, across those plans and, uh, and people. And on that note, document sharing was also a challenge. Um, just right on, as I said, with the information requests that were sent to these jurisdictions when asking for specific documents, they could be provided back in a number of mediums, whether that be filled out by hand and scanned back in, whether that be filled out via PDF electronically. Um, sometimes it's hard to predict which way you're going to get, which form you're going to get some answers back in. So with this uh, central, centralized platform can really address the challenge of uh, taking in so many different documents and having to dissect um, and putting them into a readable format. 
uh, workflow progression as in the previous potential case use was also a challenge here um, as dashboards would also be very beneficial to track that update progress. And finally, version control. Um, version control was difficult as there were many different iterations of draft documents um, and our knowledge management system would really, really address that by putting those final documents first and by uh, by date completed. Another challenge was reminders and the tasking of assignments, again, as in the previous, uh, previous potential case use. Um, all reminders and tasking assignments were done specifically through email to all stakeholders. And if that were done uh, through a centralized knowledge management platform as we have here, um, could really address some of those issues of maybe emails not sending, uh, inboxes being too full or what have you. And to address some of these challenges, um, this knowledge management application that we're presenting here would, the intended outcome would provide a repository to foster organization, collaboration, coordination, and communication during plan development, while also allowing for the overall tracking of progress of the plan development and progress within specific tasks. This, can, this knowledge management and file management system would ensure that effective vertical and horizontal integration takes place and is easily um, doable and ensures that the appropriate resources will always be available to the appropriate personnel. Some features and specific benefits of, of the system here that would really come in handy um, to address some of the challenges uh, during this plan development is just again that centralized resource information and data repository which is just a go-to for information whether that be training resources um, or specific data or contacts related to the plan update or overall uh, planning processes uh, the tasking of assignments and reminders uh, this will allow staff and personnel and all stakeholders to uh, not only be aware of the task and when they need to have that completed by, but also to track that day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week progress of overall plan development. The faceted and advanced searches would also be very beneficial. This would allow for that integration of other planning documents into this document, and also would allow a user to search a term and subsequently be able to locate where that term is discussed within all documents that may be in that repository. And this really addresses that challenge of um, asking and receiving specific plan types that specific counties may have and um, through this system those plans and documents that may be in, that may be implemented at the at a lower level at the municipal level can now be integrated back into the state plan and have a little more beef to it and in general uh, this kma will really enhance overall integrated planning uh, allow for easier coordination from state to state or from state to county and from county to municipality and vice versa and also allow for that integration between those different agencies and specific planning documents within the same level of government moving into our final potential case use uh, this really uh, gets away from the uh, hazard mitigation and emergency management areas and really focuses on um, information sharing and utilizing this technological system to empower widespread information sharing between different levels of government. Um, and again, the goal here is to strengthen to strengthen intelligence and information sharing capabilities while utilizing technological systems to empower that widespread information. And the goal here is to really have systematic sharing capabilities uh, between all federal, state, local, and international partners. This Our knowledge management application here, uh, our intended outcome would provide a file management system that's a central repository that continues to identify and house regional distribution resources, again, including training, specific personnel, equipment, locations, or what have you, to continuously build on those distribution capabilities. The system would also ensure that retainment and building of knowledge regarding 
distribution capabilities and really to ensure appropriate resources are available and easily accessible to personnel. Uh, this system can also be integrated to any government secure network to ensure intelligence products are shared securely. It can also provide a tracking system to ensure that appropriate personnel uh, have access and, and appropriate clearance to those government secure networks. And I've gone into some details on the uh, features and benefits that will that will uh, be beneficial here, but just to name off a few um, benefits, some features that would be very beneficial to really empower this widespread information sharing would be um, enhanced, that enhanced file organization, uh, some encryption, uh, tasking assignments and reminders, faceted searches, and this progress tracking. And again, I wanna uh, thank you all for listening to those uh, four potential case uses. They did center uh, somewhat around emergency management, but I do want to make clear that they can be applied to across many different planning realms, whether that be land use, master planning, transportation planning, or what have you. And at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Deepa to uh, do a little wrap up of our presentation before we get into any Q&A. Thank you, Andrew. So summarizing the aspects of the knowledge management application, um, it helps streamline business processes, it helps communicate, it reduces silos and saves time in organization, it uses this faceted search and tagging functions, it helps organize documents to ensure ease of access and accountability, it, it helps integrate plans, it enables plan, plans and ordinances to talk to one another, and finally, it helps to retain and harness knowledge and stop the brain drain. Excellent. So having strong organizational procedures and protocols is key to saving time and in many cases to saving lives. Whether it is widespread communication or document control or harnessing knowledge, knowing where to go for information is key. So in conclusion, I'd like to leave you with a few thoughts. Um, this basically uh, is a shift in the mindset. It's, it's going from, from document or file management to overall knowledge management. It's going from searching for files from memory to conducting faceted semantic intelligence searches. It's going from tying knowledge to a position, from, from a tying knowledge to a person to going to tie knowledge to a position. It focuses on effective and constant collaboration and coordination. It gives importance to systematic standardization. It improves workflow and accountability. And finally, it helps to have information at your fingertips. So I want, you, I want to thank you for spending time with us this afternoon and would like to open it up for any questions. Great, thanks Deepa. And I'll ask our panelists to turn their cameras on so you can see them during our Q&A here today. And you will see that we also have included their um, contact information for Deepa, Andrew, and Ashley in case anybody wants to um, contact them directly. So we'll go through. Uh, we're usually scheduled to go to about 2.30 Eastern. Um, we'll see how many uh, questions we can get through in that time. And uh, as always, you can always continue to submit the question through the questions tab. Um, so I'm just going to start here, as I usually do, uh, with some of the questions that came in recently. And with, this one is from Diane Walbrecker, who asks, um, does this KMA connect with Web EOC or any other emergency management system used by many states? Diana, um, that is a, a good question, and we have been asked that in the past. Um, it does not directly integrate with Web, Web EOC. However, it helps you prepare all the information that you need in a format that can be fed into the Web EOC. This is not a grants application system or, uh, or any other system that replaces um, something that's used for, uh, for grants or any other specific purpose, but it helps you organize that information to feed into one of those mandatory systems that need to be used. Okay, so just, I'll just pause in case anybody else wants to add, add to that before we move on to the next question. We're good? Okay. 
Um, here's a question from Remy Miller who asks, uh, what has mach machine learning taught us about how teams that don't use it can implement effective protocols for unifying a team to so store information in the same way when everybody has their own ideas of what's best? Ashley, you want to take a stab at that? Sure. Part of the process is working through everyone's ideas and developing the best file management schema for you, whether that's how you name individual files, how you nest your folders, et cetera. Machine learning actually does not require those nested files we're all very used to in our Google Drives or SharePoints, et cetera. Um, because it's reading the metadata, the tag data on the document, these file schemas are more for our benefit. It's familiar, it's intuitive. Um, so you have to start to bridge the gap between how humans read and use files and how machines read and use files. And going forward, some of those breath practices are going to have some overlap. But for the most part, we need to start thinking in terms of um, how the computer systems are reading the files that we that we use going forward. Okay, thanks, Ashley. Um, next question here is, how do you recommend that agencies such as planning, emergency management, housing, et cetera, uh, proactively collaborate when creating or updating their respective plans so that the coordination is more seamless? I think the um, I think one of the first steps in what we have um, encountered in our efforts um, to integrate across agencies and across plans is is actually conducting manual reviews of plans, um, identifying um, goals, identifying policies, identifying metrics in these plans, looking for gaps, looking for contradictions. Um, identifying what has not been addressed in a plan or what has not been taken into consideration. Um, and, and this has been uh, an arduous exercise. Uh, initially, we started with physical copies of plans, uh, you know, raised that high on a, on a tabletop and actually manually going through them. And now we're at a point where, you know, most plans are electronic, but it's still, it's still a difficult exercise to, to go through it. So using a system like this will help um, will help to easily integrate across concepts and policies, as as Ashley had you know um, shared examples on how you can conduct these searches. But above that, what what it does it 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 enables you to pull information from each of these documents and put it into a, a a new document and do what you want with it. So that's where um, you know the the plan reviews can be done just once, and you don't have to go back to it constantly to get information. Um, so it is a it, it is a challenge for these um, agencies. Uh, they have you know in the past they have not been collaborating as much as they should have just um, because of staff constraints or time constraints. But an application such as this makes it almost um, imperative and, and seamless to, you know, to, to uh, coordinate between jurisdictions and between departments. Great, thanks Deepa. Um, here's another question from Diane Walbrecker who asks, is the planning guidance from FEMA organized in a searchable way? I'm really not sure how to answer that question. I think it depends on on the the document format. Ashley, if you want to sort of elaborate on that, I'm not sure I quite understand either. FEMA's guidance is um, all cataloged on the FEMA websites. They have their own internal um, internal filing schema. Um, however, if you wanted to download some of those uh, guidance documents, templates, checklists, job aids, etc., and include them in your own internal system then you would, you would file those according to, to your organization's filing schema. Okay, yeah, and Diane, if you want to uh, clarify that uh, with other comments or questions, um, please put that in the, in the questions tab and I'll pass that along. Um, in the meantime, we'll go back to, uh, to other questions and here's one 
uh, for the group. Uh, you mentioned during the presentation the shortcomings of centralized systems such as SharePoint. Uh, are there systems that are that you would recommend that have the more or most robust features? So this uh, this system sort of does um, most of what SharePoint uh, would would do. Uh, if you're looking at other systems such as OneDrive or Dropbox or or Box. They are literally file management systems. They, they hold your files. You go in there and you put that information and then you pull it out when you need it. But what this is meant to do is it's meant to hold files. It me it's meant to um, sort of, uh, you know, garner knowledge, if you will. But it also lets your documents do the work for you. So when, when the documents have been indexed and tagged and uploaded, all of that information is taken and stored in the system. So when you pull it down for information, it's pulling, it's aggregating information, it's pulling information from different sources. So it is, um, it is quite different from um, just what, what a SharePoint uh, can do. Uh, the ontology aspect of this is sort of a, a plugin that can be used for, um, uh, for agencies that are using SharePoint. So that way, they're not, this, this system is built on Alfresco um, and uh, for agencies that, you know, have recently migrated to SharePoint or you have are comfortable with SharePoint, this has all the features, but it also, rather than having you switch completely to, from SharePoint to, to this system, um, SharePoint users can, can use the ontology as a plugin so they will have, you know, they'll be able to continue with SharePoint but have the benefit of the ontology. And the faceted searches. Excellent, thanks, Deepa. So we did get a response here from Diane, who mentioned that she understands, uh, but actually makes a comment that it would be great if FEMA could organize their guidance using a KMA. So I don't know if, if that's something you've thought about as well in I'm developing this guidance. Slowly but surely. Okay. Um, next question here is, if my community wants to prepare an updated comprehensive plan and we want to integrate the jurisdiction's existing plans in, into, a new, uh, into a new KM system, if asked, what would be your first steps? Andrew, I'll let you um, take that one. Our first steps would be to uh, gather all those planning documents and drop them into the knowledge management system into the repository. And then once in, uh, once you have all the desired plans within the repository, then you can perform that integration through any semantic or advanced searches there. Um, but again, the first step would be really to um, identify uh, your, your communities that you're working with and the specific plans that you really wanna tailor your specific uh, repository to would be that first step. And, and I think the workflow and, assi uh, and, and the reminders sections of the, the application will help in tracking which communities have submitted their plans and documents as well. Because sometimes that, that is a challenge in just, uh, in our experience, we work with counties that, uh, that have 50, 60 municipalities and just tracking uh, their submittals or non-submittals becomes time consuming and, and a challenge. Got it. Thanks, Deepa. Um, next question here is, uh, with systems that have been in place for a long time, let's say 25 years or more, what are the challenges in setting up an ontology that works to encompass the entire universe of documents in a jurisdiction? And how are these multi-layered terms built into the metadata? Okay, I, I'll attempt to answer part of this and then I'll, I'll get a, uh, let Ashley um, sort of continue. But um, just to sort of clarify, the ontology that we have developed is a generic ontology that can be used nationwide and worldwide. They are a list of regularly used concepts and ideas and definitions. So we don't expect that a lot has changed over the years in, in, in terms of terminology. But there are new terms that, that are coming into play that in our case, we'll add to the ontology. But the ontology itself um, is, is pretty robust and 
we think it captures a lot of what has already been it been included in plans in the past. We have actually, our ontology specialists have actually reviewed plans that span you know 20, 30 years to pull out those concepts. So we are confident that uh, the vast majority of the terms are included in the ontology. And if they are not, if they're new terms, they will be vetted and, and brought in and introduced into the ontology in the future. Um, Ashley? Just two things based on that. Um, the first one is to remember the semantic search gives you things you might also be interested in. So if a, a hazard mitigation plan recognized the terms flood and mitigation and hazards in public, et cetera, it might also notice that there are very specific words that are included throughout that aren't in the ontology but are repeated many, many times. For instance, the, the Ashley River might always be mentioned throughout the local hazard mitigation plan. I believe that's Charleston. Um, so there's two things. The semantic search is looking for concepts that might be related but not necessarily in the ontology. And then the second option is we have the ability to manually tag documents. So while the, the main ontology is national or international in scope, you may want to tag these documents with hyper-local or jurisdictional specific terms to assist with that, that search capability. So I could tag Ashley River and various small towns, agencies, local names, uh, local acronyms, et cetera. So they're not in the main ontology, but you tag them manually to, uh, to better support your jurisdiction. Great, thanks, Ashley. Um, here's a question. Uh, what about old documents that may be scanned from paper and are not originally digital? Um, old documents will be scanned and they will be converted into electronic documents and put in a format where they will become part of the search. Um, that is a question that a lot of jurisdictions have asked us because they have a number of paper copies. Uh, we are trying to get to a point where we, we want to be futuristic and sort of move away from anything that is uh, in paper or even uh, electronic but not searchable because, uh, you know, we, we find ourselves constantly looking at PDFs that you can't highlight, you can't do anything to, and it makes it almost useless. So our goal is to sort of, uh, you know, convert them to electronic copies that can become searchable as well. Anyone familiar with OCR, that optical character recognition, that's the process these documents will go through. Understood. Okay, uh, here's a question from Jeffrey Vernick who asks, uh, what was the cost of this project and who sponsored its development? So um, the, the project is, uh, was sponsored, part of the project was sponsored by CDRI um, through the fellowship that I had mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the project costed, I, I don't have like a, a number to give you, but it, it costed anywhere between 80 and $100,000. Uh, part of it was sponsored um, by, by CDRI and the rest of it was uh, done by some of our technology experts for, um, who had um, experience working on other similar projects that could bring emergency management into the mix. Which actually leads to a question I had. Or were you going to add something, Ashley? Okay. Um, I mean, are, are you working on uh, next phases of this? I mean, given that it's an international initiative, um, I imagine that it's a way to kind of pull together this approach, um, not only within the U.S. and and the applications and case studies you uh, provided, but also maybe use elsewhere. Is Are you working on those elements as well or in collaboration with the CDRI? Yes, yes we are. We're currently um, looking to develop a, a, a knowledge portal for them that's going to be open um, to the public that will house a number of publications and, and papers and scholarly articles. So it's going to be tied to this. While the base of this is Alfresco, the base of the that system will be Drupal. But yes, we are. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a couple more questions here. And then uh, if folks do want to ask more, please do include them in the questions tab. And so the next one here is, um, where do these EM knowledge management systems break down and what are the obstacles uh, to implementing them? Mm. 
What we have found in, in our conversations is that uh, sometimes agencies are reluctant to, um, to move towards change, um, and that's applicable to anything for the first time. So there is that reluctance of like, oh, we're leaving something that we are com comfortable with, even though it's really archaic, uh, and we'd rather stay with it. So uh, I wouldn't really say that's where the breakdown is, but that, that's one of the challenges. Uh, but once you overcome that and you jump into this, uh, you get comfortable with it very, very quickly. Um, and it is a, this is the way of the future. In fact, it is the present. Uh, just about every other industry, um, you know, has uh, AI and machine learning integrated into just every, just about everything they do. So why not emergency management? So um, that is sort of. Um, um, that is one of the points. I, I forget the latter part of your question. If you can repeat that for me. Oh, that were what? What are some of the obstacles to implement the systems? Ashley, you want to? I'm thinking it's still that human element. Uh, I talked about it earlier um, with the question regarding everyone thinks that they have the best way. Um, again, the machine doesn't care how many file folders we have, how many files are in our folder, what's nested under what. So it's it's the human element is the challenge to get past the way we're comfortable, maybe complacent doing it, and moving towards a system that would be the most optimal, the most efficient for our, our um, organization's missions and goals. Right, thank you. Um, if next, I, if, oh, if go I ahead. Can add one go thing. Ahead. In, in order to sort of uh, reduce that apprehension to moving to an entirely new system, we have kept some of the basic functions very similar to a SharePoint or a OneDrive. So some of those nuances, you're just used to looking for a certain word, a certain term in a certain place. A lot of that is, is kind of standard to, um, you know, to make the system as user-friendly as possible. So thank you. Great, thanks Deepa. Um, next question here is from Curtis Steinert, who asks, um, what consideration should be included for security and usability during an emergency, for example, power outages or other disruptions of communication systems? I would say um, the first thing is redundancy, and that's something that we are we are looking at. While everything is housed in, in the cloud and is going to be available to pull down from, you know, 24-7, um, there will be redundancy that you can, you know, if the information, the files are saved, you will be able to pull it from the desktop. But um, I think the biggest challenge here in, in emergency situations is not being able to find the documents and the policies that you need at any given time. And we come across this with just about any level of government, whether it's a, it's a government for a thousand people or a large city or a metropolitan area or a state or a county. Um, it's just during crisis times, there's just not um, not knowing where to go because people fill in other people's positions and they're not familiar with the setup or the file naming convention or the schema and just or waiting for someone who's probably deployed. Uh, there's a lot of shifting that goes on during a disaster. And sometimes people are deployed uh, you know, staff is deployed for six, seven months at a time, and they completely switch off from their current jobs. They are in a in a new place, and they're working that disaster and working long hours. So they are they are, you know, missing an action for several months. And for things to stall, you know, we've had situations where contracts have stalled because people are deployed, and and this just sort of. Uh, helps that continuity, whether people are out in the field or those who are in the office taking those positions and filling those gaps, um, it helps continuity to a great extent. Great, thanks, Deepa. We have a couple more here. And again, if anybody wants to ask another question, please include it in the tab. Um, and this next one is from one of our colleagues here in Maryland who asks, uh, since most jurisdictions are moving their documents and plans more to a web-based environment, how would this change the guidance you might be providing jurisdictions if they want to incorporate integrated knowledge management systems? Ashley, do you wanna address that? To be 
let's say platform agnostic. If you know that you're, if I'm a local jurisdiction and I know my county and state have migrated to, to platform X, um, then I would probably look at also um, utilizing the same platform to ensure that continuity, that interoperability um, between all layers of government, um, especially during an incident. Great, thanks, Ashley. Um, here's another question um, about um, the technical capacity. Can you speak to a case of vertical integration of this knowledge base among jurisdictions, for example, state to county to municipal and vice versa? Yeah, we are currently in conversations with a state that's looking to, um, uh, that's interested in using uh, a system like this. Um, at the state level, they have few counties, so they want to be able to um, to pull the counties in and look at it as a collaborative and collective effort between the states and the counties. And the counties, in turn, would be looking to encourage the, encouraging their municipalities to use it. So if you look at it, it would be used in all three levels of government. Uh, this is a small state, so it, it's a uh, um, it's it's workable because the state is interested in uh, in implementing this statewide. Uh, but there may be cases where um, the state just says, you know, each county do your own thing, but the county can still look to uh, implement it at the county level for one or two or three different departments, but also at the jurisdictional level. And and uh, the counties are interested uh, in in our conversations with them when we talk. Um, about a, a, a comprehensive system, they are thinking comprehensively. They're not just thinking, oh, their planning department of five people or their EMA of five people. It's like, what about the 30 municipalities? And so that conversation is coming in. And I think uh, there, is, there is beauty in, in vertical integration. In fact, we didn't go into all the nuances of vertical integration, but um, you know, we, we, have, uh, we have folders that, that will help, you know, uh, sort of transmit information seamlessly between state and county and county and municipality and so on and so forth. Great, thanks Deepa. Here's a question from Kenya Wheeler who asks, uh, what are your recommendations for integrating NGOs and community groups in the emergency response process? This was a challenge during COVID-19 response, especially for areas underserved or mistrustful of government support. And are there insights into machine language that could uh, provide EM and planning practitioners uh, for this use case? Machine learning, I meant. I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but I'll take the, the, the former part of the question in terms of integrating um, sort of non-government officials into the mix. I think that is key and that's a step that needs to be done constantly um, during blue skies in that having um, NGOs and having these community emergency response team, these certs, which, which is just you know uh, common citizens, uh, become part of the process and educating them, I think is, is, is key to having a successful uh, recovery effort because uh, you, know, you just sort of uh, open up that arena of people who, are, who can actually help in response and recovery efforts. Um, the thing with systems like this is obviously, you know, the best thing would be to educate them um, on machine learning and AI and, and so on and so forth. But systems like this, because it's, it's going to be used by governments, local, state, and or perhaps even the federal government agencies, the security is very tight. So you can't let anyone access the system. This, this system is designed for named users. Um, so, you know, I will, Deepa will have a license, Andrew will have a license, Ashley will have a license. They're only named licenses. So you can't really enter the system unless you are a user, you are a subscriber. So it becomes challenging when there are people outside the government agency because they're not part of the government, they, they kind of come and go. Um, so that's that's just something that you know we're going to have to do a little more research on on what might be the best uh, best way to to train people who are not government officials. Ashley and Andrew, I don't know if you want to add anything from your experiences. 
Yeah, I can kind of take the second part of that question regarding underserved communities. Um, the development of this actual application or system um, would have to be done in coordination with a you know, equitable outreach and stakeholder engagement strategy. Um, the two aren't, but are kind of mutually exclusive. You know, if you want to include all um, kind of traditionally underserved communities, you're going to have to find that. Uh, find those special specific ways to reach out for them, whether that be going into the community uh, for a specific community event or uh, or what have you. Um, but I think the development of the actual application compared um, must be done in tandem with that real um, kind of equitable outreach strategy that really has to be thought about when trying to include um, those underserved communities within this. Great, thanks, Andrew. Um, with that, I think we're going to wrap today. Um, thanks to everybody who submitted the questions and thanks to our presenters. I did, as usual, want to give uh, Deepa from our panel our uh, the last word so that you can kind of give us some takeaways from what we talked about today. Sure, thank you, Michael. Um, so I think I would say uh, think knowledge management uh, think integration through um, machine learning, uh, think a whole community approach, and finally, um, embrace technology. It's here and it's here to stay. Thank you. Great, thanks Deepa. And with that, we're gonna conclude our webinar, Collect, Create, Classify, Curate, Enhancing and Integrating Planning and Emergency Management Capabilities. I'd like to offer a giant thank you to Deepa Srinivasan, Ashley Samaniski, and Andrew Estrain for a great presentation to everyone who attended today and to John Coleman, our communications and technology guru who helps to make this all happen. Uh, the complete recording of today's webinar will be posted on smartgrowth.org. Also, for those who have requested one, all attendees will receive an email that will contain a link to a personalized certificate of participation. Please look for this follow-up email if you need the certificate to claim other continuing education credits. When you e exit from today's webinar, you'll be asked to participate in a short evaluation. Please take a few moments to provide feedback so that we can continue to improve the webinar experience for you. And finally, keep an eye on smartgrowth.org and your email inbox for details on other future webinars, including uh, many actually coming up, the importance of a geographic approach to planning with ESRI, which will be next Tuesday, uh, how zoning uh, broke the American city and how to fix it with um, Nolan Gray, the author of Arbitrary Lines. That um, information will be going out uh, this afternoon. Also, we have uh, farms under threat, Choosing an Abundant Future with the American Farmland Trust, which will be on September 29th, and our uh, annual Walktober walk in our series with the Maryland Department of Transportation that'll be happening in October. Uh, those links are already up on smartgrowth.org. So with that, we hope to see you soon and wish everybody a great day.